In this video, I'm going to show you one of my favorite games of former world champion Jose Raul Capablanca, the legendary player from Cuba, former world champion. He had a very fine positional, strategical style. It was very difficult to beat him throughout his career. He lost only 34 games. And his style, I think you can learn a lot from it. He uh, was very difficult to beat, as I said, but it was also the way he played, it made it look so simple, the, the chess moves he uh, brought to the board. It's very instructive. You're going to learn a lot. You will see some fantastic tactical idea at the end. But before I'm going to show you the game, I would like to ask you to become a subscriber to the channel, become a member of this uh, sort of community, as I would like to... Uh, to teach you more about my favorite games. And I want to let you know that I'm reading the comments. So if you have any specific request on games you would like to see covered on this channel, make sure to drop a note and I will think about it. I cannot, of course, um, fulfill all your wishes, but I will do my best to uh, include it on the channel. So let's have a look. Jose Raul Capablanca playing with the black pieces in this game against Josip Bernstein. And Bernstein was also a very strong player, uh, not as strong as Capablanca, but he became one of the very first grandmasters in uh, in the world in 1950. The World Chess Federation, FIDE, introduced these uh, highest uh, titles and he was one of the first to, to get it. So very respectable player. And let's see what happens in this game. Bernstein goes for 1d4. We have the uh, Queen's Gambit. C4, E6, it was one of the favorite openings of uh, Capablanca. Very solid positional style, which perfectly fits with, um, with the way he wants to, uh, to develop the game. So we get a quiet start of the game, all kind of standard moves in the Queen's Gambit. Declined, Bishop G5, castling Kingside and E3. There are various possibilities uh, here. Knight B7 is a reliable developing move, so the Knight overprotects the knight on uh, on f6. And after rook c1, Capablanca's idea is to do something about this bishop on c8. It's not a good piece, but after b6, the idea is to put it on b7. And at some point, probably this diagonal will be opened. And then the bishop is excellently placed there. White captures on d5 with a pawn. Black recaptures with a pawn. And now various uh, possibilities here. Of course, a logical move here would be to get a bishop out to d3, but Bernstein comes up with a very interesting idea. He played here the move queen a4. And now you're thinking, what is this queen going to do? Well, after the move bishop to b7, Bernstein's idea is to go for the exchange of bishops. And that's a remarkable idea because you expected now that with the pawn on d5, this bishop on, d7, on b7 is not doing that much, but it should be clear that the bishop, it's a good defender of, uh, of this central pawn. And now, okay, Black got to do something about it, Bishop. He decided to take now on a6. So Bishop takes, Queen takes, and Black played the move c5. And, uh, well, Black is trying to get a nice pawn formation in the center. And uh, I think White has maybe a pleasant advantage if you if you can just castle here. That's, uh, that's kind of solid game. Probably the Rook will come to d1. You're trying to put pressure against uh, these pawns. That's White's main strategy. But... The move played in the game by Bernstein is quite remarkable. It's not the kind of move you would uh, often see nowadays. He voluntarily traded off the bishop for the knight. Now, it, this game was played in Moscow 1914, more than a century ago. But nowadays, it's pretty well known that in open positions, bishops are considered somewhat more valuable than, uh, than knights. If you ever going to consider trading it off, then you will probably wait until black challenges that bishop with uh, with a move h6. So it's a remarkable uh, move, not a blunder, but I would say it's positionally not the best uh, move in the position. So let's see what happens. Black recaptures with a knight, so the pawn on d5 remains very well defended. Pawn takes c5, b takes c5, and we do get a structure where black has two connected pawns on c5 and d5, and they are usually strong or weak. It depends on whether white is able to exert pressure on these pawns. But white's gonna castle, uh, castle first and black gets the queen out of the way, offers the exchange of queens with the move queen b6. I think that's a very, very logical and good move. After the exchange of queens, the structure improves for black. Now the pawn on c5 is even better defended 
and thanks to a nice pace advantage in the center, Black is very, very happy with um, how the game uh, evolves around this point. So White decides to keep Queens on the board because Queen on b6 also attacks the pawn on um, b2. Queen goes back to e2. Now, I think this is the most instructive moment of the game. So let's have a look what's happening here. If you would have given me this position as Black, probably I would have made a Rook move. I'm not sure where I'm going to place the Rooks, but likely something like Rook fd8, Rook ac8. It's kind of a standard plan to support these pawns. Now, I think the position is pretty balanced. It's like neither side is really able to make a lot of um, improvements uh, around this point. That's a very logical way of playing. But Capablanca plays a very ambitious move and that's a very important strategical idea. Let's have a look. He goes for the move c4. At first sight, this looks like it doesn't really accomplish anything. And if it does something, it, it just gives away a square for a white knight on d4. So white has always the possibility to plan the knight on that d4 square. That's going to happen in the game and we will soon talk more about it. But I want to let you know that if white wants, he can play here a move like e4 with the idea to just try to trade off all the pawns in the center, aim for simplifications. If you take on e4 and then after knight takes, knight takes, queen takes, you're attacking the bishop, bishop goes to f6, you take the pawn on c4 and the pawn on b2 will be taken as well. And very likely this is going to end in a draw. This is a very natural sequence of moves. But in the game there followed rook fd1, logical move, rook fd8, and now the move knight d4 was played. So here we have an interesting clash. So we see that white has a blockade on the dark squares. These knights, they cannot be chased away by a black pawn. So white is looking as if its position is rock solid. However, the downside of having the knights there is there cannot be uh, exerted any pressure against the pawn on d5 and the pawn on c4. So black is doing quite okay and with the pawn on, uh, on c4, there are also ideas later, for instance, to put a rook on b8 and attack the pawn on uh, b2. With the pawn on c4, you're preventing white from carrying out that uh, move b2, b3. So that's one idea. Now, after the move bishop b4, uh, black still has ideas to go rook a b8 and there's more pressure against the pawn on b2 very, very soon. White already foresaw these kind of uh, things happening and decided to play here the move b3. Now, if pawns are getting swapped, then, well, that's that's nice for uh, for white because the pawn on c4 is an advanced pawn and potentially quite strong. So white wants to trade it off. But, okay, he will do that, but black will decide the conditions. Black plays here the move rook a c8. And now after pawn takes c4, the idea is to recapture with the pawn from d5. So the pawn is now on c4 and there is no white pawn standing in the way. It's a passed pawn and it's gonna be supported by the black pieces. It's already protected by the rook on c8. White cannot take the pawn on c4 for, for that reason with the queen. But at the moment, the knight on c3, it's still a good blockader. White played the move, rook c2, is planning to bring the other rook to the c-file. And now everything is about this passed pawn. Is it a strength or a weakness? That is the big question. Well, it's gonna be answered very soon. And now Capablanca played another very instructive move as he also voluntarily traded off his bishop for the knight. Bishop takes c3. Rook takes c3 and the knight comes in to d5, attacking the rook on c3. Now the pawn on c4 can be taken, but it's not a good idea as it does run into the move knight c3. It's a knight fork attacking the queen and the rook. And the rook on c8 indirectly defends that knight on c3. So white is not advised here to take the knight as black is just going to recapture. Black wins the exchange in uh, in this case. So after knight d5, rook is under threat, rook gotta go away. And the idea of black's play is now revealed as the pawn comes forward to c3. It's supported by the rook and the knight. And here we see the further the pawn comes, the more unpleasant it will be for white. So rook dc1 was played. The idea is that if the knight goes away, you can take the pawn on c3. But black is going to maintain its knight on d5. It's a very important piece. Rook c5 played. Knight went back to b3 to kick the rook out. The rook goes back and white goes knight d4. White cannot do much because if you look at this rook, it's, it's a bad blockading piece. It cannot go anywhere. It cannot leave the... Uh, the black uh, passed pawn uncontrolled. So 
White is happy with a repetition of moves, but the rook just goes back to uh, to c7, and now if you're knight b5, the rook goes to c5, and this is very nice, nicely played by uh, by Capablanca. He's attacking the knight on uh, on b5. There are various possibilities here. You would expect the knight to go back to d4, but then basically Black has gotten his rook for free on uh, on c5. It's gonna be a difficult game to convert, but there are still plenty of play. And the, the way to play such positions is not about trying to find a way to break through, but it's let your opponent suffer. White cannot make that many useful moves. I would recommend a move like g6. Maybe you play h5. Maybe you're trying to bring up the pawn, looking for another way to impose new threats later on. And white, white is just standing there with its uh, rook on c2, dealing with that passed pawn. So that's probably the way... Uh, the game should have uh, progressed from this point. But Bernstein thought he can take the pawn on c3. And that is a huge mistake, but it had to be calculated from afar. Now, black captures on c3. Rook takes c3, rook takes c3, rook takes c3. And everything seems to be under control. Because if you give a back rank check, it's uh, not made because the white queen can still interfere. And now the problem is that black would love to play here the move rook d1, which normally would just win the queen. But now it's white to ignore the threat and give a back rank checkmate himself first. So here we now we understand also why moves like g6, they are kind of useful. It will forever take away these uh, threats like, like a back rank mate. Let's go back because instead of playing queen b1, I'm asking you to find the best move. Can you see the move? Capablanca played here in the game. It's a brilliant move which wins the game on the spot. It's a nice tactical idea. We understand that the white queen is still a very important defender. And I'm going to show you the move played in the game. 3-2-1, queen b2. That is the move played in the game. It's a brilliant queen sacrifice with the idea of deflecting white's main defender. If you take the queen, the rook can come down to the back rank with checkmate and the white queen can no longer block the check. That is the main idea. Any other moves, for instance, if you play a move like rook c2 to save the rook, to attack the queen, then black has the move queen b1 check. Now it's very, very fine move because after queen f1, the rook has been driven, has been forced to go to an inferior square. It can now just be taken and that wins the rook. The other line I would like to show you here is after a move like queen e1 to cover both the back rank, covering your own king as well as protecting the rook on c3 has the drawback that the queen has too many defensive tasks. Now the queen is overloaded and with a nice other tactical idea, we are able to deflect the white queen from its defensive duty. There is queen takes c3, queen takes c3, another queen sacrifice, rook d1 check, and after queen e1, rook takes e1, it's checkmate. So after the move, queen b2, Bernstein realized that it was game over and he resigned the game. I thought this was very instructive and I hope you also enjoyed it. Let me know in the comments what you think of this game. If there are any other Capablanca games you would like to see covered or maybe another game of one of your favorite masters from the past. Let me know and I'll be your host. Thanks for watching. See you soon. Bye bye.